considering the future of the Bredor Lakes and the areas into which its waters flow and collect. And we have showed leadership by sharing our visions and ideas and by collaborating these past few days. And I have to admit that ever since I saw that eagle this morning, when my mind wanders, I, I see that eagle again. And I think of the, the Bredore Lakes and its future and the image of the eagle comes back because there's a sign of its health that it exists. And when I think of the first people to live around the Bredore Lakes, again, I see the eagle for I know for these people, the first people to live here, it is a, a vital and, and, and important symbol. The, I see the eagle when I think of the big change that happened to the south of us across the border in the United States this week. The eagle is their national symbol. And I remember how 25 years ago they had hunted their national symbol to the point of extinction. And it was we in Cape Breton who found a way to deliver them nesting pairs of bald eagles. And now their national symbol, thanks to us and our intervention in a healthy way, continues to exist and to thrive. And what, as I, I think, and, and my mind wanders today, I can't help but think that the world needs more of what we in Cape Breton are doing for the Bredore here today. We have decided to collaborate and bring our range of experience and strength and courage to making sure that there is a future seven generations from now with all the, the tenets and principles of two-eyed seeing to ensuring that this water and the people who live around it and everything that's connected continues to remain connected and to thrive. And a long time ago, and I'll, for the benefit of you young people, there was a time when there were two channels on television. <laughs> and in that time emerged a program where there was a host who saw the world in much the same way. And he taught us. He, they called him a broadcaster, but essentially he was a teacher that we are all connected. And he reminded us that science is not an isolated thing, that it is a part of who we are, and that we are all connected. This man was two-eyed seeing before we decided to put words on it, at least we who are not Mi'kmaq. And he helped us to see our interconnectedness in a new way. And for that, he's been rewarded and awarded all over the place. He's a member of the Order of Canada and, and welcome everywhere he goes for this point of view. And 25 years ago, 26 years ago, he decided to form a foundation in his name to do what we are doing now with the Bredore Lakes, to encourage people to gather and to consider science, but also our interconnectedness in making the world a better and healthier place. And so it's fitting that as we consider and wrap up our thinking of the past three days, that, that he arrives here now. We can call him a scientist. We can call him a broadcaster. We, ultimately, he's a teacher. And now, with his wisdom, he is one of our elders here in Canada. And we are fortunate fortunate to have him with us today to, to, so that we may benefit from his experience and strength as we move forward with our important work. Please welcome Dr. David Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I've met the 13 chiefs of uh, Mi'kmaq territory. I'm so honored to be welcomed onto the traditional territory of the, the Mi'kmaq people. Thank you 
very much. When I met uh, Keith Christmas and he uh, invited me here, I was delighted at the uh, possibility. I just happened to be in Halifax and it was possible and my wife would be with me and uh, she's never visited this, uh, this place, so I was absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to come and Keith is going to show me the sights, I guess, tomorrow on, uh, on the Cabot Trail and uh, make it a memorable experience. But I'm very, very honored and, and, and delighted to have an opportunity to just come at the end of your conference here because I've learned what CEPI is and been very, very impressed with the process that you've started here. You see, in BC, I remember when the battles were raging over forestry during the 1970s and 80s, and a man named Bill Bennett became the premier, and God, there were fights all over the damn place in British Columbia over forestry, and so to, to get them out of his hair, he set up round tables in communities where the battles were, were going on, and the round tables, he, they invited all of the stakeholders. I hate that word, stakeholders, but these are, you know, the outfitters and the, the hunters and the loggers and the truckers and the First Nations, and as if First Nations were just another group of stakeholders. I mean, but, and then basically duke it out in the various communities over the future of the forests. And then a few years ago, we started another process in British Columbia called PENSIMA, the Pacific North Coast Integrated Management Area. And that was to be from the, the panhandle of Alaska, uh, from Haida Gwaii, down the coast of British Columbia to the northern tip of Vancouver Island. That whole area of the ocean was going to become an area that would be managed as an integrated management area. And again, all of the stakeholders came in and the the feds and the province, and, and uh, again, there, there was a promise. But the problem is with the round tables in forestry is everybody was there as a stakeholder to fight for their stake. And they were duking it out, basically. And they never did what I urged them to do, which is come together and all agree, first of all, agree that all of you you can thrive as long as the forest or as long as this whole coastal area flourished and was healthy. Your job here is to ensure that whatever is done in these areas doesn't in any way impinge on the health of those ecosystems. As long as the forests and the oceans are healthy, everybody can benefit. And then you can duke it out over what is your share. But always remember that the constant goal or the, the platform from which you spring is we got to be sure of the health of these ecosystems. And that's what excites me about what you're doing here, it seems to me. I mean, I've just got a very superficial knowledge of what you're doing. But when you have the feds and the, and the province and the, the municipal folks here and the First Nations are a prime uh, group driving this activity to talk, first of all, about how do you protect the health of this lake system. That's the, the best way to do it, is to ensure that's your highest goal, and then you find ways of ensuring whatever you do, whether it's aquaculture or agriculture or forestry or whatever, doesn't in any way harm that pot of gold that you all depend on. So I congratulate you all for being a part of this process, I look forward to seeing what comes out of this as you begin to work uh, together over the years. I, um, I've been very proud to work with the Haida in Haida Gwaii. That's the island archipelago off the northern coast of British Columbia. I've got a bit of a stake because Tara and I have two Haida grandchildren who live up there. So we feel very bonded to the area, but we were also very involved in fighting to protect the bottom third of the archipelago as Guayanas, this uh, vast area of Haida Gwaii protected from logging. But for years, after Haida, uh, Guayanas was recognized as a national park reserve, the Haida kept saying, no, that's, that's not good enough. You don't understand. You don't just end the park at the, at the seashore. 
It's the, the land isn't separate from the ocean. And after fighting for years and years, they finally got uh, Parks Canada to agree that Guayanas would extend from the tops of the mountains 10 kilometers out into the ocean to the ocean floor. All of that is now Guayanas. And I think that is a beautiful illustration of what we can learn from indigenous perspectives that see the interconnectivity of everything. Just because it's land and here's the ocean doesn't mean there's a line you draw between them. They are intimately interconnected. I, uh, I don't, I haven't acquired much information about the local issues you're going to talk about here. So what I thought I would try to do is to provide you with what I've been concerned with for many years, which is the big picture. The, what's going on on the planet and what the problems are, the context within which you are carrying out your deliberations. Island people, of course, I feel in Haida Gwaii, again, as in Cape Breton, island people understand much more clearly than mainland people that there are limits. Your limits are circumscribed. And you know when you're dealing with garbage or sewage or, or, or logging or, or, uh, uh, or water issues, you know that there's not an infinite supply. And I think on an island, you have a much better capacity to see the whole picture. What is going on here is a microcosm of what's going on in communities, thousands of communities around the planet. How on earth can we live to, uh, in balance with our current needs and practices and a sustainable future? And I don't think there's any magic solution. There are many different solutions that all will be found in uh, local communities. This, this discussion about sustainability is uh, absolutely essential today because we stand at a critical moment in all of human history. What we do or do not do, and last night I spoke in Halifax and the Minister of the Environment was sitting right there at the table with me. And I said, what we do or do not do in the next few years could very well determine whether we as a species survive to the end of this century. Now that's a pretty melodramatic statement. You know, we're talking about the extinction of human beings. It's not me that's making that statement. It's some of the leading scientists of the world. A few years ago, uh, Sir Martin Rees, the royal astronomer in Britain, an eminent scientist, was asked on BBC, what are the chances there'll be human beings uh, on the planet by the year 2100? And his answer was 50-50. An eminent scientist saying that we could be extinct by 2100, the chances are 50-50. James Lovelock, the man who talks about Gaia, that is a term describing all of life on Earth, <coughs> has written a book who says by 2100, over 90% of all huma human beings will be gone. And Clive Hamilton, an eminent eco-philosopher, uh, in Australia has written a book called Requiem for a Species. And we are the species the Requiem is for. Guy McPherson, an eminent uh, retired ecologist in the United States, has actually put a, a time uh, very early in this century when we will go extinct. To these people, I say thank you for telling us we have an urgent problem. We can't mess around. But for anyone who says it's too late, I tell them to shut the hell up and go away. What's the point of saying it's too late? We're going to fight right to the end if we can. When you hear, when you're, when you're told it's too late, it's totally disempowering because you think, well, what the hell? What's the point of doing anything if it's, it's too late? Besides which, I don't think we know enough to say it's too late. It is very late. All of the curves are looking very, very grim. But I believe that no one can say it's too late because we don't know enough. You have to cling to hope. And my hope is not some Pollyanna-ish idea, oh, well, you know, good things are going to happen. No. I know how ignorant we are. 
In 2009, well, you know, the, the most valued species of salmon in the world is called the sockeye salmon. You don't have any over here, we do, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and the sockeye is valued because it's got that bright red flesh, very fatty tissue, and we love it, it tastes so wonderful. And the biggest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River in British Columbia. And we like to get 20 to 25 million salmon coming back uh, every year. In 2009, just over a million sockeye returned to the Fraser. And I remember vividly turning to Tara and saying, that's it, they're toast. There's just not enough biomass to get up to the spawning grounds to keep this species. One year later, in 2010, we got the biggest run of sockeye salmon in 100 years. Now, I use this story not to show how stupid I am, because <laughs> nobody knows what the heck happened. Nature shocked us. And I believe nature is full of surprises. If we can pull back and give nature a chance, I believe she will be far more generous than we deserve. But we have very little time to pull back and give her that chance. But I do have, I'm filled with hope uh, based on that experience. This, uh, today, scientists are calling this time, this moment, the Anthropocene Epoch, a period in geological time when human beings have become the major force altering the chemical, physical, and biological properties of the planet. There's never been a species able to do that before, in all of the four billion years that life has existed on Earth, no single species could change the properties of the planet as we are doing now. We have become a, a huge force of nature. And that sudden status as a dominant force of nature today has come by the sudden conjunction of a number of factors. Population. There were never a billion human beings on Earth in all the time of our existence until the early 1800s, about 1830, we reached a billion people. I was born in 1936. There were two billion people when I was born. In my lifetime, the population of the planet has more than tripled. And every one of the additional human beings needs to breathe air and drink water and eat food and clothe and shelter ourselves. Just the sheer weight of our numbers. We're the most numerous mammal on the planet. There have never been so many billions of any mammal. Or maybe even birds. I know that birds numbered the uh, passenger pigeon maybe a billion. But there, there's just never been this many uh, mammal, uh, mammals on, on Earth. And because there are so many, we have a, a very heavy ecological footprint takes a lot of air, water, and land to provide for our survival. But of course, we're not like rabbits or rats or mice. We use an enormous amount of technology, and virtually all of the technology we take for granted today is, it has been developed over the last 100 years. And that technology enables us to exploit every nook and cranny on the planet for things that we want to use, and to use the entire planet to dump our toxic wastes. And that amplifies very much our ecological footprint. And ever since the end of World War II, we've been afflicted with an incredible appetite for stuff. We love to shop. And, uh, you know, American uh, teenage girls consider shopping their number one recreation. So you not only shop and have fun, that's your exercise that you get, I guess. But because of our consumptive demands now, that amplifies again our ecological footprint. And now we have a global economy to serve the prov provision of all those consumptive things, uh, consumer items, and to use the entire planet to throw away the waste that comes from our consumption. So when you add all of these factors together, our numbers, our technology, our consumptive demand, and our global economy, that is the reason we have become such a powerful uh, force on Earth. And the problem with that is we don't know enough to be able to manage our impact on the planet properly. 
We don't really know what sustainability is anymore. We're guessing. The consequences of our power today is obvious everywhere. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. We now are over 400, 400 million parts of carbon per, per 400 parts of carbon per million. Uh, that's up from 260 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution. And we're on our way to 500 this century if we don't cap and reduce our emissions very, very quickly. 500 parts per million will be catastrophic. The, um, the oceans that cover 70% of the planet are a mess. Who could imagine that humans could have such a huge impact on the oceans? But we are. The carbon we've added to the atmosphere dissolves into the oceans as carbonic acid, and the acidity of the oceans is changing. And we are throwing away our garbage, which ultimately ends up in the oceans. You all have heard of the famous islands of plastic bigger than the state of Texas in the great gyres of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. We have added the runoff from our farms that is now creating huge areas of eutrophication, dead zones where nothing can live, and there are dozens of these spread uh, throughout the oceans of the world. And our technology for fishing has become far too powerful. We are overfishing the vast majority of commercial species to virtual extinction. So these are the, uh, some of the problems. Our forests are vanishing. Over 80% of our forests have been invaded by humans. And if we carry on at the rate we're, we're logging, uh, the rest will be gone within the next 20 years. We're using air, water, and soil as garbage cans for toxic material. I'm sorry to tell you, but every one of us here in this room carries dozens of toxic chemicals in our bodies. What do we expect? If you use air, water, and soil as a garbage can, do you think we're not going to ultimately get it into our bodies? And we've now entered a period called the sixth extinction, a mega extinction crisis. In the past, we've had five great extinctions. And now we have entered a sixth extinction phase that we, as one species, are causing. So this is a consequence of our becoming this powerful force of nature. How did we get to this point in time? Now, I know that every people has a creation story or an origin story. What science is doing today is providing us with an origin story that goes way back beyond human memory. And uh, I've been very impressed with the way scientists can now use DNA, the genetic material, and track the movement of people over the planet over time. And all of the trails lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. That was our birthplace on the Great Plains of Africa. And I'm still waiting for the Ku Klux Klan to invite me to give a lecture so that I can tell them, we're all Africans for God's sake. What's your problem? So our, our habitat was the great grasslands of Africa, which must have been a, a place filled with animals and plants uh, in abundance that we can't even imagine today. But for some reason, we began to move out of that habitat that we, we evolved in. We don't really know why. Maybe the population was growing a little too much. Maybe we were over-exploiting resources we were using. Uh, I like to think it was teenagers looking for some action. You know, we bred, with, we bred with Neanderthals, so maybe they were looking for some Neanderthals over on the other side of the mountain. I don't know. But for some reason, we began to move. And as we moved into new ecosystems, we were an invasive species. We had no idea how things worked. We just look, holy cow, look at these birds. They don't have wings and they're really yummy to eat. And we began to conk them. And even with simple tools like spears and, and stone axes, we were a very deadly predator because we were smart. We were intelligent. And you can actually follow a wave of extinction of megafauna, the big animals, as we began to move across the planet. So we were a very effective predator. And so as we moved into new areas, we didn't know how things worked. We began to extinguish. And soon 
people had to say, geez, we've run out of those. Remember those plants we used to use? There, there aren't any more. Or those those uh, uh, big sloths, the slow moving, they were too easy. We've, we've done them in. So you had two choices. You could move again looking for more. Or you could stay and say, we got to live in a different way. And I believe that that's the history, the roots of indigenous knowledge. The people that said, we're staying. They learned the hard-won lessons of their ancestors. Their ancestors made mistakes. They screwed up. But they did trial and error, and they learned from the successes, from the, the failures. Those hard-won life lessons were the essence of indigenous knowledge. And that knowledge worked because they've survived in their place for tens of thousands of years. No science will ever duplicate indigenous knowledge. I know there are people that... I know there are people, there are a lot of uh, First Nations people that want to call it indigenous science because they think putting science on, on that knowledge base makes it, props it, uh, pumps it up. And I say, no, no, no. Science is a very restricted way. It's a very powerful way of learning. But indigenous knowledge, it's the science <coughs> insights we gain is not essential for survival. Yeah, yeah, you publish a paper and you get a promotion, but, you know, it's, it, the indigenous knowledge is hard-won knowledge for survival. And we know that it works because people have survived in their place as long as they have. And so don't call it science. That diminishes it. This is traditional knowledge that is so very profound. Get the rest of society to recognize what a treasure lies in indigenous knowledge. We in the non-indigenous community should celebrate, honor, and thank all of those communities that have clung despite everything that has been done to them, that have clung to that knowledge because it's essential to tell them where they live and how to live on this earth. Let's begin to celebrate and treasure that. For 95% for of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We followed game and plants through the seasons. We had to carry everything on our backs. We're doing a series for uh, the nature of things now, a three-part series on the horse. And boy, when humans realized that we could domesticate the horse, just Think of how that changed the way we did everything. You suddenly had all that muscle power of a horse. You could travel vast distances in a short time. Anyway, that's uh, just a little advertisement for next season's uh, nature of things. But for most of human existence, we had to lug everything we owned on our backs. And so, you know, we lived in a very different way. When you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer, you know you are a part of nature and you depend on nature for your survival and your well-being. In the last 10,000 years of our existence, we changed dramatically when we discovered the roots of agriculture. When humans became farmers, we didn't have to move anymore. We could actually have a steady source of, of food and we could begin to set down roots in place that de didn't depend on, on that movement and for 10,000 years, we have evolved as farmers. In 1900, most people in the world, including Canada and the United States, lived in rural village communities because most of us were involved in some aspect of farming. And when you're a farmer, you know damn well weather and climate, you're absolutely dependent on weather and climate. You know the importance of pollination. <coughs> and pollinators. <clears throat> you understand the amount of snow in the winter is directly related to how much moisture is in the soil in the summer. You know that there are plants that will take nitrogen out of the air and fix it as fertilizer in the soil. Farmers understand that we are absolutely embedded in and dependent on nature. So that's been the history of our species. But in the last hundred years, we've gone through an unbelievable shift. We've had this explosion in population so that by the year 2000, there were over 3 
1,900 cities with more than a million people. In 1900, there were only 14 cities with more than a million people. London was the largest, I think, with about 6 million people. But by the year 2000, we had over 300 cities with more than a million. The 10 largest cities all had more than 11 million people. And the majority of people around the world lived now, by the year 2000, in big cities. In Canada, 85% of us live in a big city. I have a friend who lives in the north end of Toronto. He lives in a high-rise, air-conditioned apartment. In the morning, he goes down the elevator into the basement, gets into his air-conditioned car, drives down the Don Valley Freeway into the basement of his air-conditioned commercial building, and that building is connected through tunnels to huge shopping areas. And he told me one day, he said, you know, I don't have to go outside for weeks. So we live in a very different way. And now, you know what I see, I was, Tara thinks I'm obsessed with this, but everywhere I go, I, I see over half of the people on the streets or in a subway or in a car are, are doing this. And they've got their ears plugged into earbuds and they're, they're not even aware of what, we no longer are aware of the world around us. We don't pay any attention to it. So when you live in a big city, what's your highest priority? It's your job. I need a job to earn the money to buy the things I need. And so the economy then to urban people becomes our driving, the driving force of our lives. And it's not surprising then that we had for nine and a half years a prime minister, he, Stephen Harper, who said, we can't do anything about global warming. If we try to reduce emissions, it'll destroy the economy. So Stephen Harper elevated the economy above the very atmosphere on which we depend. And now the Americans have gone backwards and they're trying to join uh, a Harper approach with the election of Donald Trump. We, um, and so, I just wanted to tell you a couple of stories that illustrate the, the problem that we have when we begin to put the economy at the top of the agenda. Back in the 1980s, when did we start first get involved with Lytton. Okay, back in the 1980s, Tara and I were approached by the Lytton Indian Band and they said, the BC government has given a permit to Fletcher Challenge, a New Zealand forest company, to log the Stein Valley. And they said, the Stein Valley is our valley and it's sacred. We don't want that to be logged. Will you help us? And so I agreed to, uh, to help them uh, fight for that valley, and I, during that battle, I met the CEO of Fletcher Challenge. And the CEO said to me at one point, listen, Suzuki, tree huggers like you willing to pay for those trees? Because if you're not willing to pay for them, they don't have any value till someone cuts them down. So I'm going around going, oh, Jesus, well, we could pick berries every year and uh, maybe we could cut down some salal bushes for flower arrangement and uh, maybe we could uh, uh, find a cure for cancer. Meanwhile, he's going, well, there are this many board feet of lumber, there are this many cubic meters of pulp, this many jobs, and this, this much money. And I, you can't win in that kind of an argument because the reason we're fighting for that valley is it's sacred. Where in the economy is there a value for something that's sacred? There isn't. And so in the economy, that doesn't cut any ice. It's not even an argument for protecting that forest. And the reasons I'm, that's what the Lytton people wanted, is to protect it because it's sacred. I'm looking at it as a biologist and saying, you know, those trees and all the green things in that forest are taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen back in. That's not a bad service. I mean, if all the green things weren't doing that, we wouldn't be here. But you know what economists say? Well, if you cut down the forest and you lose that, that service that nature does, that's an externality. It's not relevant to the economy. That forest is pumping millions of gallons of water out of the soil, transpiring it into the air and affecting weather and climate, an externality. The forest is clinging to the soil so when it rains, the soil doesn't run into the spawning gravels of the salmon and spoil them. That's an externality. The forest is an ecosystem as long as it's intact, is providing habitat for birds and mammals and, and insects and fungi, countless other species. All of those 
things that the forest is doing that keeps the planet rich and habitable for an animal like us are regarded as irrelevant to this economic system. So I can't use that to argue with the CEO of a forest company and I've got to run around trying to figure out the value of berries and salal bushes. We'll never win in that kind of an argument. And we keep getting sucked into that discussion all of the time. Well, that'll cost too much. If you do that, that'll cost too much. We always use the economy as a reason for not doing something. And we have to run around trying to find, oh yeah, but there's an economic benefit. If you use windmills instead of, of, uh, of uh, burning diesel, uh, that, you know, that you'll save money. We, we cannot win if we have to constantly justify what, what we are talking about through an economic lens. The ludicrousness of this is illustrated, I'm sure you've all heard about the triple bottom line. This is what all of the serious uh, corporations use when they talk about uh, uh, the environment. Well, we've got to look at the triple bottom line, society, the economy, and the environment. And usually they draw them as three circles of the same size, all right? and you overlap them, and where all three overlap, that's the sweet spot. You do something there, and you benefit the economy, society, and uh, the environment. This is the most ludicrous idea you can imagine, the triple bottom line. And you know, the real depiction should be one big circle. It's called the biosphere. It's the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists. And within that big circle are 10 million little circles of different size. Those are all the species that live within the biosphere. But right now, when you draw the circle that way, there's one great big circle that's 40% of the area of that big circle, and that's us. We've taken over 40% of the net primary productivity of the biosphere, and we want more. Uh, but within... The, our circle, there should be one tiny circle, and that's the economy. The economy is there to serve us. But the ludicrous idea of a triple bottom line is that we make the economy, society, and the environment all of equal size. And so don't get duped into thinking that that's the kind of uh, visualization we have to have in our minds as we debate the future uh, of this area. So that was an important insight I gained from arguing with the CEO of that forest company. That so long as we get sucked in that way and having to argue with him in economic terms, we'll never win. The last story I want to tell you about happened three years ago when I got a phone call from the CEO of one of the largest companies in the Alberta tar sands. And he said, would it be okay for me to come and talk to you? And I said, oh, I'd be thrilled. I'd be honored. I'm not into fighting. Come and see me. The next morning, he showed up at my office in Vancouver. You know, and I greeted him. I said, thank you for coming. It's such an honor, and I'm so happy, and went through da -da -da -da, all that stuff. And then I said, you know, I'd like you to do me one favor. Before you come through that door, please leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside. I want to meet you as a human being meeting another human being. I want to meet you man to man. Because quite frankly, Mr. CEO, I don't want to talk about oil or the future of the tar sands till you and I agree on what are the fundamental needs of human beings, not just in Alberta or Canada, but around the world. Because surely we've all got to start with a conversation on a, that begins on a foundation of fundamental needs that everybody agrees to. Well, he wasn't very happy about that. And, but to his credit, he came, he came in. I could see he was reluctant, but he came in. I said, look, he came into my office. I said, thank you for, for doing that. I know that this is not what you expected, but let me explain. I said, we live in a world that is shaped by laws of nature. And those laws constrain the activities we can carry out. I said, physics tells you we can't build a rocket that will move faster than the speed of light. 
We know the speed of light is the limit. And nobody talks about, oh, we have to go 10 times faster than the speed of light. We accept that. The law of gravity means when you trip, you're going to fall on your face. Gravity dictates that, and there ain't nothing you can do about that. And the first and second law of thermodynamics tell you you cannot build a perpetual motion machine. Those are dictated to us by laws of nature, and nobody argues with that. We live within that. Chemistry, it's the same. The atomic properties of each of the elements, their, uh, their net charge, positive or negative, their, the size of the atoms, the, uh, the reaction rates and the diffusion constants, they all dictate the kinds of atoms we can mix together and the kinds of molecules we can synthesize. And we live with that because chemistry defines, the laws of chemistry define what we can synthesize in a test tube. And you, you know, there's no point saying, oh, I wish I could react this with that. You can't. You live with that. And in biology, it's the same. Every species of plant and animal has a maximum number that can, be, that can exist sustainably or indefinitely. It's called, it, that number is dictated by the carrying capacity of an ecosystem or a habitat. So you, if your population goes up and exceeds the carrying capacity, your population will drop. Well, you could say, well, yeah, but we're, we're not like any other organism. We don't, have to, we don't have a defined habitat or ecosystem. We're smart. We can adapt to many different conditions. It's true. But ultimately, the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, that's where humans live. And there will be a maximum number of humans that can be sustained indefinitely by the carrying capacity of the biosphere. Of course, the number that exists of humans that could be carried indefinitely is not just a func function of our numbers, it's a function of our numbers and how much each of us consumes. So in Canada, we consume 20 times more than the average Indian or Chinese. We consume 40 or 50 times more than the average Somalian or Bangladeshi. So we, uh, we are very high on the food chain as, uh, as a society. And every scientist I've talked to has said, humans have far exceeded the carrying capacity of the planet. You, the planet cannot in, sustain indefinitely 7 billion human beings. Well, people, politicians and business people get really mad when I say that. They say, look, go to the stores. Look, we're, we're filled with stuff. We're living longer. What are you talking about? We're, we're exceeding the carrying capacity. We, carry, we are creating the illusion that everything's all right by using up the rightful legacy of our children and grandchildren. Talk to any elder here. What was it like when you were a kid? All over the world I've talked to elders, and they all say the same thing. It used to be so different. The rivers used to be jammed with fish at certain times of the year. The skies used to be dark with birds at certain times. The land was filled with herds of animals. The air was, uh, was heavy with the sound of birds. I mean, over and over again, you hear stories of elders. And if those things aren't here now, what do we think? Where have they gone? If they're not here now, they're not anywhere. The world has fundamentally changed because we are using up what our children and grandchildren should have expected us to leave for them. We, uh, that's all told to us by carrying capacity of the planet. But biology also says that we are animals. And a few, many years ago, I gave a lecture in uh, Austin, Texas. It was the green, first green building conference in the United States. There were about 3,000 people in the audience, and all the kids were in the front. There were lots of them. So I said during my speech, I said, you know, if you remember one thing, kids, from my speech, remember we're animals. My God, their parents got so pissed off at me. <laughs> Don't you call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. I was shocked. I looked at this woman. I said, if your daughter's not an animal, is she a plant? <laughs> because biology tells us we are animals. And as animals, our fundamental needs are dictated to a, dictated by our biological requirements. I said, Mr. CEO, what do you think is the most important thing every human being needs as an animal? And I could see, instead of giving me the answer, any kid will tell you the answer. 
He went, well, um, and I could see he's thinking money, a job. Uh, I said, look, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So please, Mr. CEO, do you, don't you agree with me? Clean air has got to be the highest priority of all people on the planet. And then I said, you and I, we are 60 to 70% water by weight. We're just a big blob of water with enough thickener added so we don't dribble away on the floor. And, you know, we lose water, right? It comes out of our skin and our eyes and our nose and our mouth and our crotch and we lose water. So we have to drink water to top up. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink contaminated water, you're sick. So can we put clean water with clean air? as one of our highest priorities. And then I said, food is a bit different. We can go a bit longer. Some of the people here can go quite a bit longer. But in four to six weeks, four to six weeks without water, you're dead. And most of that food that we eat comes from the soil. And if food is polluted with toxics, we're sick. So can we put clean food and soil with clean water and clean air? And then I said, every bit of the energy in your body and mine, every bit of the energy we need to do work or move or grow or reproduce, all of that is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants through photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy, and then we get that by eating the plants or the animals that eat the plants, and we store those molecules of energy in our body. And when we want to do work or move, we burn those molecules in our body and release the energy of the sun back out. That is also something, clean energy from the sun. Surely that's up there with clean soil and food, clean air and clean water. That, I said, Mr. CEO, I believe, is what indigenous people around the world call the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And they are the critical elements that we get from the earth that gives us our lives, that gives us our health and our well-being. I believe they should be the foundation of anything we do, any way we live, whether you're a corporation or an individual, we've got to always ensure we're protecting the four sacred elements. And then I said, you know, the miracle of life on earth to me is that those four sacred elements that are so essential for an animal like us are cleansed, are replenished, are created by the web of life itself. The air that we depend on is created by plants in the oceans and on land. Without them, oxygen is a very reactive uh, element. It will react, the oxygen reacts very rapidly and disappears. It's only the plants that keep replenishing the oxygen through photosynthesis that animals like us can live. When water falls on the land and percolates through the soil, it's the tree roots and other plant roots and soil fungi and bacteria filter that water so that we can drink it. Life cleanses that water for us. Life creates the very soil on which we grow our food. And if anyone has seen the movie or read the book, The Martian, you know, one of the ludicrous things about trying to set up a colony on, on another planet, there's no soil on Mars. Oh, there's a lot of sand and dust and clay, but if you saw the movie, you remember Matt Damon gets stranded, he's got to live four years on Mars, not one year, but he's only got one year's supply of potatoes. But what the hell do you do to grow more potatoes? Well, you dig a hole in the sand and you poop in it because it's only life that creates the soil on which you can grow your food. Life creates, and it's, of course, all of the green things that give us the energy, even the energy we take for granted, coal, oil, gas, uh, uh, wood, peat, uh, dung, all of that is created by life that comes from plants through photosynthesis. So the miracle of life is that biodiversity, the web of living things, what indigenous people call our brothers and sisters, that geneticists proved are in fact our brothers and sisters because we carry thousands of genes in our bodies identical to genes in birds and trees and fish and carrots. 
because we're all related through a common evolutionary history. And that's why when indigenous people call, talk, talk to us about the clan system and our brothers, uh, birds or mammals, they're speaking truth. They are our relatives. And so surely we treat our biological kin as in a much more respectful way than if we simply regard them as resources. And so I said, Mr. CEO, that should be the foundation of how all people, all economies, all corporations live, protecting our most fundamental needs and finding ways of, of operating without in any way impinging on those sacred needs. I said other things, the lines we draw around our property, around our cities, around our provinces, our, around our, our countries, they don't mean anything. I mean, we think they mean something. You know, we go to war, we'll kill and die to protect these borders. Nature couldn't care less about human borders. But we take our borders so seriously. How do we manage the salmon along the coast of British Columbia? They're born in British Columbia waters, but the salmon go through the Alaskan panhandle, up the Alaskan coast through Russia and, and Japan, and then they come back. Who do they belong to? We try to manage them through our national borders, but those fish don't belong to anyone. They know where they belong and where to go back to their, the streams where they were born. But we take our borders very, very seriously. Nature couldn't care less. This is why I talk to Alberta people who say, you got no business telling us what to do about our tar sands. And I say, you know, if you want to dig them up, if you want to burn them, I'm happy as long as whatever you do stays within Alberta borders. Then fine, you can screw up your province, I don't care. But of course that's not possible because everything is interconnected to everything else. And then we create things like capitalism. We create economies. We create corporations and markets. These are not forces of nature. We invented them. And yet we bow down before this idea. You know, I talked to Preston Manning once, and we were having a good conversation. I said, market. And when he said the word market, he went, oh, yeah, markets. Praise the market. Hallelujah. Free the market. Let the market. I said, what the hell are you talking about? We invented it. It's not a thing that exists out there. Read the finance paper, uh, financial pages every day. You'd swear the economy, oh, economy's not looking too healthy today. You know, you think of the economy sitting there like this with an ice bag on its head and think, I feel so shitty today. I'm just not going to do any work today. Like, what the hell? We invented it. And yet we're constantly asking nature to fit our economic demands. We've got to get trees to grow faster. We've got to get fish that grow bigger. We can't, we can't make nature fit our agenda. We have to fit our inventions so that it makes sense from uh, a biological standpoint. So these ideas of corporate, you know, just look at the way we treat corporations as if they're, my God, they're God-given things. I'm just reading a book now that says the market as God. We have literally replaced the concept of God with the market. And the market has all of the properties that God had in the past. So we've got to find ways of protecting the, the basic elements necessary for life and happiness for all people, and then find ways to develop things called economies and corporations and markets that fit and make sense within that perspective. And I said to the CEO, if you would shake hands with me and agree with that, that these are the foundations of the way we live, and whatever we do, we have to protect those things clean air, clean water, clean soil. I said, if you will shake hands, to me that's a sacred bond or agreement. I will do everything I can to help you and your company. Well, you know what he did. He, didn't, he couldn't shake hands. Because he knew if he went back to his shareholders and said, well, I had a discussion with Suzuki. Whatever our company does here, we mustn't do anything that will, will in any way impinge on the air, the water, and the soil. He'd be fired so fast because his job is not to worry about the economy, that's an ex the environment, that's an externality. His job is to make money. 
That's all. Make money. The more and the faster, the better. So I believe that this is the, the, the absolute nub of the crisis now. We keep asking as if we somehow have to serve the economy. No, it's the wrong way. We've got to protect the most important values, the things that keep us alive and healthy. And then we've got to work on how do we get an economy that will work within those constraints. And that's why I can, uh, I just want to end on one thing, and that's why I felt I've been, I was galvanized in 1962 by uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And that was the beginning for many people around the world to get involved in the environmental movement. When that book came out in 1962, there was no Department of the Environment in any government on the planet. The environment just didn't exist as something we think of as today. But because of her book, Silent Spring, all about the effects of pesticides, she galvanized millions of people to get involved in the environmental movement. And there were huge successes. We've got millions of hectares of parks and reserves protected. We've got laws. We've got environment departments at every level of, of government. We've got laws to protect air and water and endangered species. But what I've found is that battles that we thought we won 30 or 35 years ago, we stopped a dam at Site C on the Peace River. We stopped a proposal to drill for oil in Hecate Strait off BC. We stopped the American proposal to bring super tankers of oil down the BC coast. All those things have come back and we're fighting them again. So the fundamental failure of environmental, the environmental movement was to use these battles to change the way people see their place on the planet, to begin to move to a different way of living with the Earth. If we have to battle the same fight again, we're going to lose a lot of them, and we're just going to diminish those things that we were fighting for over time. And that's why when David Boyd, an environmental lawyer, said, why don't we think about getting uh, a constitutional amendment? Let's see if we can put in the Canadian Constitution the right to a healthy environment. That is, to be a Canadian means you are guaranteed a right to a healthy environment. Let's try to do that. And we chose to do it in a very difficult way. You can try to elect a government on the basis of a promise to enact a, a constitutional amendment. That's the way most amendments have happened, is by electing people who will then do it. We said we're going to do it a different way. We're going to get a powerful grassroots movement to support the idea of a right to a healthy environment. And that, if we can get enough people supporting this, they can put pressure on their local municipality or, or town or city and get them to pass some kind of legislation to protect a healthy environment. And if we can get enough movement at the, at the grassroots level, then that will put pressure on the premiers so that the provinces can be urged to pass legislation to protect a healthy environment. And if we can get seven provinces supporting this idea with more than 50% of the uh, Canadian population, then we go to the feds in Ottawa and say we want an amendment. So this was the idea we chose. We call it the Blue Dot Movement. The Blue Dot is, a, the, the, of course, planet Earth. It was depicted so beautifully in Carl Sagan's essay about the, the planet. And uh, we began a seven-week bus tour starting in Newfoundland and working our way back to Vancouver. And we, Tara and I said, this has got to be a big tent. This isn't just environmentalists. We have to deal with issues of hunger and poverty. A starving person who comes across an edible plant or animal is not going to say, oh, I better look at the endangered species list. They're going to kill it and eat it. I would. So if you don't deal with hunger and poverty, forget about the environment. If you don't deal with people who uh, uh, lack so any opportunity for social justice, they've got other priorities than worrying about the environment. People who live under issues of genocide or war or terror, they're worried about surviving. So I said, let's try to get a broad tent of all the groups that are working on these areas of hunger and poverty and social justice and equity and, and uh, freedom from war and terror. And they're in our tent, all looking for 
some kind of guarantee of a healthy environment. Well, of course, the first group we went to were indigenous people across Canada. And all of the people I met with, Ovid Mercredi in, in Ontario, uh, in Manitoba, Miles Richardson, uh, uh, we talked to Perry Bellegarde when he uh, was elected. The, they were all completely supportive. And um, the first community we went to in, uh, so the First Nations and musicians and artists and entertainers became part of this uh, bus trip. We had Neil Young in Vancouver and we had uh, Joel Plaskett in, in Halifax and we had uh, 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 Gordon Lightfoot in Toronto and uh, what's his name? Anyway, in in uh, Van, in uh, Calgary, so we in, in recruited all these big names uh, to join us. Margaret Atwood read an essay in Toronto, and uh, Bob Bateman, uh, the artist, joined us in Vancouver. And the Winnipeg Ballet composed an original dance and danced for us in Winnipeg. But in every community, it was First Nations who are were our equal partners because they said, "Duh, of course we want a healthy environment. What do you think we're fighting for?" is to live with clean air, clean water, clean soil, and other living things. And so our first community we visited starting in uh, October two years ago was uh, the, Con, Con, uh, the Con community in Newfoundland. I'd never met them before. They were fantastic. And so we came right across Canada. I said, if we can get one municipality to pass legislation within six months, after we ended our tour. That would be the beginning. Three weeks after we began the tour, Richmond, British Columbia passed a right to a healthy environment. And by the time we finished, six communities had passed legislation. Today, we have 142 communities. And that includes... <laughs> I, just, I just found out last night in our talk, that Halifax passed it just uh, a month or so ago. But we also have Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, the big centers have all passed it. Of almost half of every Canadian, half of, uh, one out of every two Canadians now lives in a community that has passed the right to a healthy environment. We have over 100,000 people who have volunteered to help us work on getting, uh, supporting the Blue Dot movement. Now we're talking, we're talking to Glenn Murray, the Minister of the Environment in Ontario, very supportive of getting uh, environmental legislation on this. I talked to Margaret, she's your Environment Minister, Miller. Last night we sat next to each other. I said, you guys got to do this. And she went, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Uh, we're, we're also, we've got very strong uh, uh, inroads into Quebec. I think I might actually live to see it happen. But the important thing is the conversation that's going on. When people say, what's a, right, what's a healthy environment? And then you begin to understand how incredibly embedded we are in nature because we depend on air, water, soil, and biodiversity for our health and well-being. So I really think that uh, this has been a powerful movement and uh, we have a good shot at getting uh, this as an, uh, uh, a constitutional amendment. I think I just want to end by thanking the First Nations, not just here, but all around the world, who Tara and I, over the last 30 years, have been on a long journey of learning, because learning about that indigenous sense of rootedness to place and the kind of profundity of the knowledge base that indigenous communities have. So thank you so much to all of the Mi'kmaq people. Thank you for hanging on to what you've what you've inherited, for fighting to protect it. Because we are now going to come to you. We non-Native people are going to come to you. And thank you for being willing to share that knowledge with us. Thank you. Wilalan David Suzuki for reminding us uh, of our right to a healthy environment 
And what I, I will offer you in return is that we who are participating in this conference accept the responsibility that goes with having those rights. And we are, with our work, doing our best to make sure that there is a future. We're planning seven generations at a time. Uh, thank you also for reminding us of our place within that environment. I am comforted to know that I'm an animal. <laughs> we are grateful uh, to all of you who have participated, the hundreds here, the hundreds who have witnessed this uh, live stream online through the Nova Scotia Community College. We would like to remember the creator who uh, makes sure that we were here, that we have a place in which to thrive. We will thank our creator with a, a closing prayer uh, with Mary Catherine Pirro, an elder from here in Wagmacook. You may know her as Molly. Good afternoon. My, uh, my name is Chief Norman Bernard from Wagmacook. And uh, Dr. David Suzuki, I'm very honored that you are here in my community. And uh, I have a small, uh, small gift for our community. Those who are traveling, I ask the Creator that He will guide you home safely. Nuchiden waso gebin chip tuk telusin megidet megwaso lidanen chip tuk igni muye gula ne mole kuledes ne nadel waso geki telishadaski chip tuk agin en telishadale mami gek aimet telamogob niglas muye gul apigashki sukra muktis pene gni muye nilo na tila biksik taashi waga ne metim ni geki eliskam geya biksik tuin. Thank you, Mary Catherine Pirro. Just a reminder that uh, Dan would appreciate another photo with the Chiefs with our keynote speaker, Dr. Suzuki. We would like to include the uh, regional mayors and wardens. This means you, um, Mayor uh, Brenda Chisholm-Beaton and uh, Warden Bruce Morrison, if you could join the chiefs and uh, Dr. Suzuki for a photograph up here. And uh, Don Silver has uh, a gift as well. Hello, my name is Dawn Silver. <laughs> um, I have a small company called Encore Jewelry. Encore uses recycled instrument strings from musicians around Cape Breton. But um, my husband Greg knows a guitar player who also happens to know Dr. Suzuki. So I have built a piece from a guitar string from a friend of Dr. Suzuki's, and I've incorporated that with Agate, which is the gemstone of Nova Scotia. And I would like to present this to Dr. Suzuki as a thank you. Thank you, Don Silver. We've exchanged many words this afternoon and for the past three days. As we go forward, let's remember that our actions will speak even more loudly. Good afternoon, Namultus.